there's a way to be in relationship with the pain that actually liberates the suffering. No one can do it for you, but it's not hard. It's not like, oh, you have to move to Tibet for 20 years and then maybe you'll be it. No, you can do it right here in this moment. And of course, that's what we're all trying to do is support people everywhere at all times in engaging in their own, let's say, true nature mm -hmm. and tapping into that dimensionality of being in ways that are really liberating. Hey folks, welcome to the Meta Hour podcast with Sharon Salzberg, where Buddhist wisdom meets everyday life. My name is Lily Cushman, and I produce this wonderful podcast. And today we have the start of a new series here on the podcast, the Real Life series, which is all centered around Sharon's new book by the same name, Real Life, which comes out April 11th, 2023. So for today's episode to kick off this series, we have a first time appearance on the podcast, and that is an interview with the incredible John Kabat-Zinn. John and Sharon, of course, have been colleagues and friends for many, many years. And this interview is actually part of a larger summit that's taking place online from March 29th to April 2nd. And that is the Living an Authentic Life Summit, which is something that came to life when this company, Wisdom for Life, approached Sharon about her new book and had this amazing idea to put together an online summit exploring the themes from her book. And so Sharon was very involved in choosing all of the speakers, picking the themes, and what has come together is just an amazing collection of speakers. It's about 30 different people. And each day is looking at a different theme from the book. And it's a whole collection of different speakers. There's Dharma teachers, there's comedians, musicians, thought leaders, scientists. And John Kabat-Zinn is one of those incredible people. So as these interviews came together for the summit, we knew we just had to share some of them here on the podcast, especially for those of you who are such devoted listeners. So the interview today with John Kabat-Zinn, there's actually a slightly longer version that's part of the summit. This is kind of a teaser. We didn't want to put the whole thing because the summit is just so incredible and it's being offered totally for free. So. This will give you a taste of what's there. And, and if you want to hear the full interview, you can join the summit. To sign up for that, you can go to SharonSalzberg.com. And again, it's called Living an Authentic Life Summit. So before we get to the episode, a couple of quick announcements. As I mentioned, Sharon's book comes out April 11th. Real Life, The Journey from Isolation, to openness and freedom. And you can pre-order a copy today. It's available in hardcover, in ebook, and also there's a audiobook format that Sharon read herself. And if you pre-order the book, it's just a huge help to us, to Sharon as an author. It helps us get the book into more bookstores. It helps it reach a wider audience. And also, if you do pre-order, there are a few free guided meditations that we're giving away that are from the book itself that you can receive after pre-ordering. So you can learn all about it at SharonSalzberg.com. Also, Sharon's doing a number of virtual events as part of the book launch. So you can check out her schedule there's lots of great stuff. It's always a big celebration to bring a new book into the world, and we're just excited to 
start telling you all about it. This is many years in the making, and today's interview is a great way to introduce you to real life. So enjoy the episode. Here we go. Hi, and welcome to the first day of our summit. I'm Sharon Salzberg, and I have the tremendous pleasure of speaking with my longtime friend, John Kabat-Zinn. Today, we'll be exploring what makes authentic living, a theme that will help frame the rest of this week's discussions, and one that John has put a lot of thought and practice time into. John Kabat-Zinn, PhD, did his doctoral work in molecular biology at MIT in the laboratory of the Nobel laureate Salvador Luria. Kabat-Zinn is Professor of Medicine Emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, where he founded the Center for Mindfulness in Medicine, Healthcare, and Society in 1995. And in 1979, it's world-renowned mindfulness-based stress reduction and BSR clinic. He is the author of 15 books, including the bestsellers Full Catastrophe Living, Wherever You Go, There You Are, and Mindfulness for Beginners. His latest book, published in 2023, is Mindfulness Meditation for Pain Relief, Practices to Reclaim Your Body and Your Life. And John, I just want to say, in terms of that last book, I'm so grateful you did it, because so many people are requiring and asking for just that. Mm. So it's so good to speak with you today, and thank you so much for joining me for the summit. As I mentioned, today's theme is all about how we can begin to live authentically This really follows along the trajectory of my new book, which offers a guide to moving from smaller, contracted places of being to larger, more expansive ways of living, true to our deepest nature. At this point, it seems like you've been teaching mindfulness forever. Your name is nearly synonymous with the practice, but I know there had been a time before you came to practice. So can you share with us about how and why you first began meditating? Well, let me begin by just thanking you for that beautiful introduction and for the invitation to be here with your, you know, this this entire community of folks who care enough to actually tune into something like this that can often from the outside seem like much ado about what looks like almost nothing, but turns out to be just about everything. So living an authentic life the irony is probably we're all living authentic lives but we just forget and we get lost and carried away so let me start actually not by uh wagging my tongue so much but uh but to actually invite anybody who's tuning in to drop in to the present moment which is of course the only moment we ever have and the only moment where we can experience authenticity and maybe realize that you're in your body. That's the funny way we say it in English is you're in your body, but you're not in your body. And you're also not your body. So who are you and how are we going to even frame this? So let me just invite you to get out of the thought stream altogether and not worry about any of that, but see if you can feel the body sitting here in front of your screen, whatever it is, and having made the decision to tune in. And you're really using us to tune into yourself. That's the only dimension that's worth tuning into, only to discover that when you tune into yourself, you're actually turning into the entire universe, of which you are an intimate and insanely beautiful and mysterious part. And so stillness and silence then become almost axiomatically commonsensical here, because you're moving from the domain of zipping through your moments to get to better moments to to simply dropping into what I often call the domain of being. And so this moment, this body sitting here or in whatever posture you're in, and bringing awareness to the body sitting here breathing. And noticing that there's silence inside and underneath and in between my words. And there may be stillness invited into your body at this moment. Relative stillness. 
of course, the breath is moving in and out of the body, so there's always this movement of life. And we can just rest in awareness, hold it all here in the embrace of awareness, this mysterious superpower that we all already have, so there's nothing to get here. This is learning how to inhabit an aspect of being that we'll hardly ever get any schooling in. And then silence and stillness and falling awake become axiomatically natural and, and they become your friends. It's a gesture of sanity to stop and drop in on this present moment. And it authenticates your being way beyond thought. You don't have to justify yourself to anybody or anything. You're like a flower emerging and flowering on earth, just like all the other flowers. And also not just like all the other flowers because you're totally unique. And can you simply be here, so to speak, outside of time and be completely at home. And let the attitude of your body, the carriage of the body, actually recognize and realize that this is a radical act of sanity to stop and drop in on the present moment in this way radical act of authenticity, if you will, being the author of your own life. If you choose to take that kind of care and responsibility, and ultimately that taking your seat in this way or just dropping in on the present moment, no matter what you're doing, is a radical act of love, not just of sanity, but of love. And then there's absolutely no place to go, nothing to do, and no special state or something that you're supposed to feel or get, and then you'll know the meditation's a big success. If you're awake in this moment, in touch with this moment, and underneath thought, even for a fraction of a second, then you're already here and awake enough for now. And if you're awake to some degree in this moment, that completely transforms the next moment. And so if you want the future to be different, the only leverage you have is to inhabit the present moment as if your life depended on it. And it does in more ways than you think. And in more ways than you can think, because thinking is not all that it's cracked up to be, marvelous as it is. And if it's a superpower, which it is, then awareness is another, even more powerful superpower. And it's right under our noses in every and any moment. All puns intended. So when you're ready, I'd invite you to open your eyes if they've been closed. And you'll notice that Sharon didn't and I didn't ring any bells. 
to say, okay, now we're starting the meditation. We're not going to ring any bells to say, okay, now the meditation's over. Because the way I'm talking about this meditation, it's never over. There's no beginning, no end. But the more you drop into the glide path of the on-ramp, so to speak, into your own life, then life itself becomes the meditation practice. And there's no separation whatsoever between awareness and living the life that's yours to live as authentically and as open-heartedly and as spaciously and with as much kindness and compassion for yourself and for this, this sorrow in the world. That's really the invitation, and it's to not miss this moment, because at a certain point, humans run out of moments. We got an infinite number of them between now and the time we're going to die, but at a certain point, we're going to have the last breath and the last moment. So the stakes are incredibly high, because you could miss the entirety of your life, and then have a little experience of wakefulness in that last moment and realize, oh my God, I got the whole assignment wrong. I just blew the whole thing. I thought it was all about this and me and getting what I needed to have and pushing away what I didn't want. And Thoreau talked about this at Walden in the most beautiful way. And so to just say, Sharon, that I'm really delighted to be here with you and to be in conversation about, I guess, what we could call the heart of the matter. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. And thank you so much for that beautiful practice and for the reminder that it's not something to kind of observe at a distance, but to live, to embody. And you brought us right there, which was so great. Um, there is one story from your past I want to tell. Okay. Uh, if you don't, actually, I want you to tell it because it had a very big impact on me uh, when we were teaching together in Florida at that time. Oh, yeah. And we yeah. were asked Parkland. about it in Parkland, in yeah. Parkland. And there's a lot to say about that, but we were asked each to describe kind of our beginnings in interest in, in contemplative practice and so on. And John tells a story about going to a lecture when he was at MIT. I don't remember if you were an undergraduate or graduate student. Graduate student. Graduate student. Okay, and there were very few people in the lecture, and he can describe what happened. Well, you but, remember that, huh? Well, I remember it so clearly because I sort of took the mental position of the teacher, going home that night thinking, wow, there were only, you know, 14 right. people in the room or something like that. Maybe I'm not good at this, or maybe this is the wrong kind of venue, or I don't have the knack, or maybe it's not going to work in this country. Or, and yet, one of them was you. Wow. And look what happened. Uh, you know, know, I've like, never heard you or anybody ha have that take on it. And, yeah. and actually, I don't talk about it very much, although I, I did write about it. But I need a moment to sort of just take that in, because you're pointing at something incredibly powerful that we all know and just completely all forget. And that is, we influence each other in ways we will never know. Mm -hmm. And to take a certain amount of trustful delight in that, that we don't have to be attached to knowing it or that it even happened. But when it does happen, and it happens a lot, then in a sense, you know, it's very much what Thich Nhat Hanh was talking about, deep bow to his whole contribution in the world of interbeing, that we really are interconnected and we're not who we think we are and we're so much bigger than who we think we are. So, so the story was basically that in 1965, I was walking down the hallway at MIT. I was a first year graduate student, as you said, in molecular biology. The Vietnam War, the Gulf of Tongue King incident had just happened in 1964. The Vietnam War was just heating up. I was like unbelievably depressed for a million different reasons with the world and with the various, you know, challenges of that particular era. And I saw a sign on the wall, like just a mimeographed kind of thing in the old days, you know, they didn't have such a great artistic ability with graphics the way they do now, because we didn't have any computers that, that weren't the size of a house. And the sign said, the three pillars of Zen, talk by Philip Kaplow, at the invitation of Houston Smith, who was a professor of philosophy and religion at MIT. And I had no idea who Houston Smith was. I had no idea who Philip Kaplow was. I had no idea what Zen was. I was 21 years old, but I went to that talk. And as you say, 
it was at seminar time, about five o'clock at MIT, there are like a million seminars going on. So I went to this one after I found the room in the maze of the MIT Megaplex. And like, there were like four people in the room and, and then the speaker and, you know, uh, Philip Kaplow and uh, Houston Smith, who were all Houston Smith and and I didn't know this at that time, but Houston Smith is like a giant in the field of the philosophy and history of religion and philosophy at MIT. And Kaplow was had an extraordinary story to tell. And he had just come out with this book, but he had been at Columbia Journalism School and was involved with the Beats and uh, Allen Ginsberg and all sorts of people in New York City. And then he was a, a journalist at the Nuremberg War Tribunals. So that just devastated him. And he told the story of going off to a monastery, just leaving the West entirely and going off to a freezing cold monastery in Hokkaido, in the Northern Island in Japan, I think it is, in the middle of winter with no central heating and sitting 12, 14 hours a day. And it transformed his body, his mind. And he told the story in a way like my 21 year old mouth was just like a gape. And it was like, holy cow. And I started meditating that night and I've never stopped. And that was in 1965. So it was a transmission of sorts. I mean, it was like, it would be really hard to say exactly what he said, but something wordless got transmitted about the potential power partly for healing, because he talked about his own ulcers and his anxiety and various kinds of things in that way, but also that, uh, and Houston Smith as well, pointing out that this, these traditions have to do with embodied wakefulness and wisdom and clarity and, and intrinsic compassion that's not separate from the wakefulness, because the wakefulness makes the interconnectedness of the universe completely manifest in a way that's way beyond mere cognition. So the whole episode just blew the top of my mind. And that was the beginning of my meditative journey, so to speak. And I've had many teachers in between then and now, you know, an infinite number of teachers, really, because between children and grandchildren and, you know, and my wife and, and my in-laws and my parents. And I mean, this is really where the teachings come from. They come from everywhere, including you and Joseph and Jack and the early days at IMS. I mean, it's just, it's just such a festival of beauty and wonder and depth of transformative possibility that it just never gets old. That's so beautiful. I mean, I guess I took his part in a way in my mental projections and my imagination because it's so easy to feel discouraged. Like what I do is not good enough or it's not having a big enough impact or I should stop doing it and not to be so persuaded by the numbers, you know, and yeah. a, that was the be all and end all. It's like one life. And, and you'll that, never know what your true effect is in the world. And it is not right. the number of followers you have on Twitter or Facebook or anything. It really has nothing to do with that. The impact that you have on the world, any of us have on the world, and I mean us, not just meditation teachers, but any, is kind of like COVID. It's like an infectious meme, only it's a positive meme that is healing. It is transformative to the degree that you're authentically who you are and not some kind of, I'll use this terminology, I've never said this before, but deep fake, where actually it's not a digital deep fake. You're your own deep fake because you've forgotten who you really, 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 really are. And you mm -hmm. knew it when you were three or four. And somehow between three and four and 13 and 14, there's very big challenges in the world, even pre-digital. But now in the digital space, it's even worse. The world, the universe, and the speed at which things are happening and children are growing into, you know, this sort of digital space, the analog world becomes infinitely more important. And let's not forget, no matter how clever AI is and, and all the, you know, sort of uh, that domain of the digital, the universe has been working on the analog for only 13.8 billion years and has come up with 
the galaxy that we live in, the Milky Way. It's come up with our solar system and this completely insignificant sun and this completely insignificant little water rock that's going around the sun in the Goldilocks zone that's just not too hot, not too cold for us to evolve out of what? Out of the periodic table of the elements, all of which either came out of the Big Bang if it's hydrogen, or uh, out of the explosion of uh, the nucleus of stars, which is where the, the iron, for instance, that's in our hemoglobin molecules, all the iron in our hemoglobin molecules that allows us to actually bind oxygen in the lungs and take it to all the trillions of cells in our body, all that iron came out of exploding supernovae. So if you don't think you are a miraculous being, I don't know where you've been or what universe you grew up in because we are on some kind of unbelievable trajectory. In some sense, you could say we're not necessarily the only or the best, but we are in some sense, the way for the universe to know itself at least in this tiny corner of the universe. And we know very, very little about it, but we know that it's possible to know. And we also know that it's possible to be so out of it and so clueless that you stop paying attention to what's really manifest and you fall into delusion of various sorts and then sort of fake truth and fake news and fake facts and all of this kind of stuff. So. The Dharma, if it was important, I guess, at the time of the Buddha's teaching, of course it was, it's infinitely more necessary and important right now. And if you step back for a moment and just think about it, and I'm doing it in real time with you, I haven't even thought of this before, but talking with you inspires me to just say, look at all the people who are out there teaching Dharma in one way or another in a fairly authentic way. This is completely mind-blowing, completely mind-blowing, and in kind of context that's both Buddhist, but even bigger than Buddhist, because it's universal, it's human. And we haven't really got the language for describing what this is or even understanding it, but it is profoundly humbling to feel that these meditative practices that look so much like nothing but turn out to be virtually everything in a very real way, that they have everything to do with now taking care of the planet before we turn it into Venus or Mars, you know, where it's unlivable in a way that we would agree is worth living. And so it's time for human beings to wake up. I mean, there's just no question about it. And I don't mean a few here and there in monasteries on mountaintops or in caves. It's time for the vast majority of humanity to wake up to its true nature and calling and place in this universe, most of which is mysterious, and then maximize well-being for all beings, including the earth itself and plant life, which is what we depend on. By the way, the chlorophyll, the green stuff, that has the same kind of structure as the hemoglobin, only instead of an iron atom at the center, it's a magnesium atom at the center. And that's what allows the sunlight to be captured by the planet and turned into food for animals and us. So it's like, holy cow, you know, this is like beyond amazing. And when we recognize and realize the mystery and the beauty of it, then meditation actually becomes the only commonsensical way to live. But not meditation like sitting on your butt and never moving. That's great and really important to do. But the meditation as being a fully embodied human and understanding that deep interconnectedness with the universe and all life. Yes, you can almost feel the competing forces, right? It's like greed, amazing. hatred, and delusion are really having their day. And yet, there's also, as you say, you know, there's accessibility to other ways of seeing and, and real practices so that you can't just admire it from afar. You can live it day by day. And you have to, exactly. Yeah. There's no admiring it from before. That's like, you know, just getting into the philosophy or what they used to say is like, Eastern philosophy, you know, and that was like a popular thing, but like, this has to be lived, has to be embodied. And that requires work, because most of the time, if you start to pay attention, 
you know, you drop into meditation for 30 seconds and you watch what your mind is doing. It's like appalling. It's totally <laughs> appalling. It is appalling. It's like, oh, it's all over the place. It's like you have one thought one second, the next second you can't even remember what that thought is because you've got another thought and then you've got an emotion and then you've got a, like my body's itching and what the hell am I doing with my ass on the cushion and I must be doing it wrong. And, and you're off in the thought stream, all sort of made more turbulent by our emotions and liking and disliking. And you think, that's what the meditation practice is. But that's not what the meditation practice is. You're just getting a clear look at your own mind. And then the meditation practice is say, hey, don't take any of that personally. That's not who you are. But that's who, if you're not careful, you could get carried away in that stream for 30 or 40 years, as I was saying, and then wake up. And as Thoreau said, he said, the quote from Walden is, I went to the woods to live deliberately to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what they had to teach and not when they came to die, discover that I hadn't lived. And that's, I think, the big motivator in a certain way to don't miss this moment because you could die in the next moment. But if you're willing to, in some sense, die in this moment, die to the future, die to the past, then you're actually being born over and over and over again into the only moment we ever really could be awake in, and that would be embodied wakefulness. And then your doing comes out of being, it's an entirely different doing than if it comes out of grasping and pushing away what you don't want, pursuing what you want, thinking you're the center of the universe. And the irony is, of course, you are the center of the universe, but guess what? So is everybody else because the universe itself doesn't have a center and it doesn't have a periphery. And that's true for awareness too. If you investigate your awareness, you can't find the periphery or circumference of your own awareness. That's why I'm saying it's a superpower and you can't find the center of it either because there's no you to find the center and you won't be there because it's like just infinitely more interesting than that and more beautiful. You've described mindfulness before as a love affair, yeah. an invitation to live your life as if it really matters in each timeless moment, uh, which is so beautiful. And so many times people these days, of course, you and I go way back and we each do. remember I the love days. That. Of, yeah, nobody used the word mindfulness. It was like, what's that? You know, and these days, in terms of authentic living, people sometimes question that word, just the word, because it can sound so cold and clinical. I mean, not to me, because in all of my training in Asia, it was so clear that there were elements in there of kindness toward oneself and connection to others and so on. But it's implicit. It's not explicit. And it's really, I think, been up to new generations to make it explicit rather than just leave it unsaid. And, and, and also apply. diversify it in a certain it's way. Right. You know, that's so right. So that it's, it's inclusive. I mean, it's the ultimate inclusivity. Mm -hmm. And it's the ultimate embrace of diversity because everything is relevant and everything has its own self nature, so to speak. And this is the beauty of awareness is that it's really boundless and free and intrinsically clear, intrinsically knowing. It's kind of gigantic mystery. No neuroscientist understands awareness, where it comes from or how you get it out of three pounds of meat and a gazillion trillion synapses in the brain. But we still have no idea how you go from that to awareness, a sentience, sentient beings we talk about. So yeah, this is like, really an incredibly pregnant moment, I would say, on the planet, because you've got this stream of Dharma that's very old and ancient and really doesn't have to do with, I mean, the word mindfulness is an English invention, but I like to say, when you hear the word mindfulness, if you're not hearing the word heartfulness, you're not understanding it at all. Because in all Asian languages, the word for mind and the word for heart is the same word. And so rather than making too big a kind of dualism out of mindfulness on this side and compassion on this side or loving kindness on this side, no, it's just like these are all different facets of the same diamond.
so to speak. And no matter what facet you go in through, yes, it may have its unique thing until you rotate it and you realize, oh no, all the facets are the same. And so that's the kind of very beautiful offering, so to speak, to realize, as I said earlier, that as soon as you really drop into awareness and perceive the interconnectedness of all things, on whatever level you perceive it, and I'm talking about way beyond thought. So not just what I was saying about the universe and the periodic table and chlorophyll and hemoglobin, but just the direct perception of the profound interconnectedness in the face of a human being that you don't know, or even an earthquake survivor in Turkey this week, or the madness that's unfolding every moment in Ukraine. And just the, the unfortunate degrees of violence and suffering that are just unfolding at, out of human ignorance, not like it's bad enough with earthquakes and volcanoes and tsunamis and floods, you know, which are natural phenomena. But when we're generating that suffering, it's, it's infinitely worse. But when you recognize interconnectedness, then compassion is, is really, it's not like, oh, now I think I better be more compassionate. It's like, it just pours out because that's the way we humans are. And there are no exceptions. There are no exceptions. Even people who, you know, there are all sorts of stories about people who've been murderers and bandits and thieves and everything else. There's stories about people encountering Gandhi, putting a, a gun to his head and he just smiles at them before he got killed. But And they would break down and cry because the suffering that everybody carries which is what the word suffering actually means, as you know, is like it means to carry. So we're carrying an awful lot. And then we have to have compassion for people who are carrying a lot because in almost all cases, it's not their fault. I'm almost willing to say in all cases, because even in the case of psychopaths, it's not their fault that their brain got formulated that way. I mean, in some sense, it's not personal, even though it's terrifying and has to be, you know, met and controlled. But but there's a certain way in which I think the circumstances of the moment are calling us to wake up as a species, not just like a few meditators in the United States imitating their Buddhist teachers or whatever. No, this is like, who knows what the real curriculum here is that we're all part of. And I love that. I mean, I really do love that because it turns out to be a gigantic adventure in the possible where if it's all about knowing yourself before you die, knowing the true nature of self or selfing and then not being imprisoned by it. What else is worth doing on the planet while, while, while we're still breathing? And, mm. once, and it doesn't mean that you can't do everything else, but when you do things with awareness and you do things ethically, because what we're talking about is really a profound ethical stance on the world and on non-harming, that's the greatest source of joy and happiness, in my experience, that's it's possible. Oh, and, it's, and we all have it. We all, it's not like, oh, some people have it and some people are just like, poor you, you didn't get born with compassion or, or mindfulness. No, it's like, these are intrinsic human capacities, but they need to be developed. And it's hard, it's hard work because the mind is so crazy. <laughs> it's appalling. <laughs> when it doesn't know itself, yeah, it's it's a big troublemaker. But it's also when you begin to, you know, when the mind does come to know itself, even to a small degree, then all sorts of things are possible. And you can at least write yourself restraining orders to cause as little harm as possible. Your awareness of your impulse to cause harm, <laughs> and just don't do it 50% of the time. That would already be great. And then to bring a little bit more joy and recognition when people feel met and seen and heard you're just by listening to somebody instead of just listening to yourself and being the center of the universe but you listen to somebody else when they feel heard or met or seen that's the kind of greatest feeling in the world it's the greatest gift you can give to somebody is your attention your wholehearted attention without some ulterior motive to profit from in some way or to, you know, be more powerful or uh, higher in status because you got next to somebody who you think is high in status or something like that. Well, I'm really moved to say at this point, actually, it's a, a 
quotation from my first meditation teacher, who was S.N. Goenka back in 1971, India, who the first night of my first retreat said, uh, the Buddha did not teach Buddhism. The Buddha taught a way of life. So this is open to everybody. And so you and I both may speak from that context or refer back to Buddhist psychology or use a word like Dharma, which means the nature of things, you know, but there are so many doors and so many ways of entering this process. I think it's a process exactly like John is describing, which is about awareness. It's coming to life. It's, it's really living. But here's an example. I'll quote the Buddha because that's what I'm accustomed to doing who said something like one who is mindful or one who is heedful is on the path to the deathless. One who is mindless or one who is heedless is as if dead already. And you see how most people live their lives, our lives, you know, and it's, it is sorrowful. And, you know, the consequences of somebody being lost in that pain are so extreme in terms of how much pain they might cause others, you know, like, John and I teaching in the Parkland community is, is one example. So five years ago on Valentine's Day, there was a school shooting in Parkland, Florida, and 17 people were killed, many students, um, some teachers or an, an athletic coach, people like that. And it was huge tragedy, obviously, for that community and spreading out. And so these things happen. They happen to regular people. And... You can see the aftermath of a lost person and and the actions they might take. And I know my being participating to some degree in that community, I've learned so much and it's been so powerful to, we need to understand that these things happen, not just to them, you know, and over there, but this is us. It's just as John's been describing, we live in an interconnected universe and what happens over there, it matters to me truly whether I realize it or not. And so that's part of being wakeful. That's part of understanding. And back to the Buddhism point, you know, I would say that, John, I truly think of you as like one of the translators of old, you know, one of the people who took the teachings or was given the teachings and arrived in a new culture and said, how do we say it here? And you were an amazing translator. You, you have been a guiding voice in that and emphasizing that, for example, this is not just about a philosophy. This is about embodiment. And it's been an amazing thing to watch, you know, as it's developed. And something you just said also about science made me think that your work has provided a stepping stone to a different kind of science, even like contemplative neuroscience, because yeah. it wasn't always the case by any means that a scientist was considered valid if they had their own practice. Oh, absolutely. I mean, because then you'd be uh, biased. You know, if you That's were right. a meditator, how can you study meditation when you yeah. already think it's worth doing? So that question came up a lot. And in the old days, and Richie Davidson will talks about this, if graduate students told their thesis advisors they wanted to study meditation in the 70s or 80s even, or even the early 90s, they'll say, well, that's a career ending move. Yeah. I mean, don't go anywhere near meditation. You'll never get a job. You'll never be hired. You'll be laughed out of the academy, so to speak. And now look, what we've undergone is in some sense an orthogonal rotation in consciousness. What would have been thought not just the height of lunacy, but completely improbable that the NIH would be funding tens of millions of dollars of research money on mindfulness meditation every single year in laboratories around the country and around the world. In 1979, when I started the stress reduction clinic in MBSR at UMass Medical Center, the idea that NIH would be doing that is like more likely that the expanding, accelerating universe that came out of the Big Bang would all of a sudden grind to a halt and collapse back in on itself. That has a very, very low probability, but the fact that NIH would be funding meditation research, even a lower probability, and yet it's happened in 40 years, which is like nothing in the span of time. So I think kind of object lesson here that it's, it's certainly not me, I thank you for all the kind words that you said about me, but, but it really is a we that we're all collaborating, doing our own thing, depending on our karma and our background and so forth, to actually bring different 
aspects of this to the fore in a way that it will be so compelling that the vast majority of people will all of a sudden slap the side of their head and say, what have I been doing my whole life? Well, I, you know, I, it's obvious that I've been living in a certain kind of dream, delusional space, creating a good deal of suffering right and left in, in the course of that, and that it's time to wake up. And then to do it and to engage in it in a way that's really a love affair. So this is not punitive or now you got to meditate. And if you only meditate a half hour rather than an hour, you're unworthy. This is about the beyond time and space. So any moment is a perfect moment. And the moments are in some sense really timeless. So let's not fall into that kind of conventional, that's just judging, that's just liking, disliking, aversion and, and dualism. And I think it's worth pointing out that these practices have to be non-dual in the sense that the more you make subject and object, or the more you make a me and a you, or you make the universe separate from me, the more you're creating delusion and suffering. And so we need a new science to understand non-duality. We need a new science to understand the relationship of thought to awareness and what roles attention plays and things like that. But from the point of view of just us regular people, you know, letting life itself become the meditation practice. And I don't think the Buddha would object to that, that it's not like, well, you have to practice like they do in Tibet, or, well, there are five or six different schools in Tibet, so which way do I have to practice? Or in Japan, well, there are several traditions in Japan, right? Soto, Rinzai, what? and you get more and more, oh, what about China and Chan? And, what about Korea? And then you get, yeah, what about Thich Nhat Hanh and Vietnam? And it's like you get terminally confused. No, they're all saying the exact same thing. <laughs> there are different doors to us, but it's the same room to a first approximation, at least. And the room is the room of the human heart and awareness. And so you don't have to acquire anything because you already have that. It's already who you are. But can we actually learn to shift our what the neuroscientists call default mode from one of being kind of on autopilot most of the time and just mind wandering terminally endlessly, which is fine. I mean, daydreaming, great. But can we actually shift the default mode a certain amount of the time, at least, to being fully present and awake and outside of time and in the heart in a way that actually contributes to mindfulness in action, let's say, or compassion in action? and then find your karmic path, not someone else's, your karmic path to contribute to this larger flowering of humanity and taking care of the ice sheets and taking care of the glaciers and taking care of the water supply for half the population in the planet and taking care of the forests and taking care of the air. And I mean, it's like we're living in a very, very, sensitive, delicately balanced ecosystem that we are basically destroying at an unbelievable rate for capitalism, for greed, for sort of building stuff at the expense of ecosystem. And that's like just greed, hatred, and delusion legalized in uh, the form of sort of Citizens United and other kinds of decisions that governments have made, how we're going to govern ourselves. That's why politics and government, I mean, the fundamental question, how am I going to govern my life? How do I behave in my own life? Well, how do we behave and how do we govern ourselves as a country or as a group of countries or as a species? So there's no separation between, say, governance and wisdom and practice. And I think this is now being taught more and more in schools. So new generations of kids are actually being exposed to this non-dual way of understanding that has never happened before at this kind of a level. And so, you know, at least we're trying to tilt things in the direction of, as I said earlier, causing as little harm as possible. Of course, we're going to cause plenty of harm because we're all like more ignorant than we want to recognize that we are. Uh, but to tilt things as much as we can in the direction of ethics, compassion, wisdom, and doing as little harm and as much good for others as possible. And then, of course, that's the key to happiness. 
I mean, it's not more for me. It's how much can I recognize the beauty that's just everywhere? Mm. Belong to it, be part of it so that we get satisfaction from the love exchange by yeah. through yeah. friendship. Yeah. I mean, we've been friends for we never a lot see of years. Each. I know. We hardly <laughs> see each other. Well, we love we each don't other. even get to practice together all that much. But there's a bond. But I'm just saying, singling you and me out just yeah, as an yeah. example. But it is a huge mystery in what I would call Dharma friendship. That is like awe inspiring, and it, it's like I'm I'm just really moved even to bring it up because I don't think about it, you know, all the time. Mm -hmm. But the just the people we know in our generation who have been at this for an improbably long period of time, and we're still, most of us, still alive and breathing. Mm -hmm. And and then when we're gone, there's whole mm -hmm. other generations that you know, are carrying this on. So it's not at all personal, but the personal element of it is profoundly endearing and moving, I would say. I mean, I feel that for sure. Yeah, it's usually moving, and that's why it's so wondrous to see you. It's great. Yeah, um, even though it's on Zoom, we don't get to Zoom, be in the same room and hug because of the yeah, weirdness yeah. of things at the moment. But yeah, I have one more question, and then uh, perhaps we can ask you to close us out with another sitting. And this brings up stuff from my forthcoming book and your last book, which has to do with contraction and expansion, which is really about a holding environment. You know, you can have something very. Uh, tightening, very difficult, very challenging going on. But the way in which it is held, your relationship to it can be open and present. Like I remember some of your very early UMass classes down in that basement in Worcester. Yeah. Because Barry Mass, which is the home of the Insight Meditation Society, is not that far from Worcester Mass. And and I kept hearing John is up to something there. He's doing something. And I thought, what's he doing? You know, and so I would drive there twice a week. To see I, what remember, he was up to. I remember yeah. I was so touched that you came and sat in on the classes. And no, it was so great. And it was really, it was an amazing time, like watching you and your people offer a potential method to relieve those students suffering because they were suffering mightily. And I think everyone probably was referred by a physician or somebody. That's right. you know, you had to be. Yeah. And I remember one man there who'd been suffering from migraines terribly for like 20, 25 years. And there was so much impact for him in doing this practice. And these weren't people taking it casually. You know, it was very important for them to see yeah. if this might be an avenue for, for yeah, some Yeah, because they'd, they'd run the gamut. They were out of uh, options from a medical point of yeah. view. And so yeah. the, the challenge was, is there something you can do for yourself that no doctor or anybody else on the planet can do for you as a complement to whatever medicine can provide in terms of treatments? And yeah, I I, I love that you, you yeah. know, I remember those days vividly. It's a long yeah, time ago, but I love that ago. you came and visited the, you know, and, and just got a taste of what we were doing. It was amazing. And I'm so glad I did. And so when I think about you writing a book on pain, I imagine that it's got a lot of those elements, like how we approach it, how we hold it, how we are with it makes a very big difference. Yeah, that's the only thing it's about. But the reason I agreed to do this book is that, because the world doesn't need one more book about mindfulness, but the reason I agreed to do it is because it's going to be full of pictures and it's a multicolored kind of abstract oh, nice. thing where the idea is you open the book or don't even open it, you hold it, and you already feel different. That there's something about the words and the guided meditations and the audio, but there's also the, you can read these guided meditations. I've never published my guided meditations before, but this is going to have a whole bunch of those original and upgraded guided meditations for exactly what you were saying, befriending the body as it is, rather than trying to cut out the pain or wall it off or whatever, and see that it's workable when you're willing to do a certain kind of work. And then it's transforming pain, if you will, or into its fundamental elements like sensation, and then like pleasant and unpleasant and neutral, and then you begin to not take personally something that really isn't personal. And that doesn't mean that you got to love, 
the situation that your body is in. But when you have a new degree of freedom in how you will be in relationship to it, actually the degree of suffering is reduced enormously, which is what our scientific work has shown over the first 10 years or 20 years of the MBSR program in terms of studying the outcomes from chronic pain patients. And it's long lasting and even more longer lasting if people continue to practice over days, weeks, months, years, and decades. So that's what that book is about, uh, Mindfulness Meditation for Pain Relief. And I'm really looking forward to it being out there because I want to see if people like it as much as I do. I've never said this about one of my books, not that I don't, I mean, I really care about every single word that goes into every single one of my books, but, but this one, because it has these sketches in it, I don't even know how to describe them, but right. you could think of them as hokey, but if you don't think so much about them and judge them, uh, I think that they may have the effect of like, befriending you in times of suffering and reminding you that there's a way to be in relationship with the pain that actually liberates the suffering. No one can do it for you, but it's not hard. It's not like, oh, you have to move to Tibet for 20 years and then maybe you'll be, no, you can do it right here in this moment. And of course, that's what we're all trying to do is support people everywhere at all times in engaging in their own, let's say, true nature, mm -hmm. and tapping into that dimensionality of being in ways that are really liberating. And they're liberating without the philosophy of liberation. It's just like an experience of like, wow, I'm, you know, and many chronic pain patients will say this, yeah, yeah, the pain is still there. They'll say still there, I would encourage them to say still here, but they'll say the pain is still there. But I feel differently about it. It's not bothering me in the way that it used to. Okay, well, that's huge. I mean, that's its own mm -hmm. form of mm -hmm. liberation because it gives you more mm -hmm. degrees of freedom to live your life in a way that's not imprisoned by your body's condition. Yeah, that's and, fantastic. When is your book coming out, actually? So I literally know uh, that. Next month, I think. It's coming okay. out sometime in March. I'm, I'm not actually sure what the public... Okay, is. it's very exciting. I want to hold it in my hand, like you said. So thank you, Sharon, for inviting me to be part of this summit. Oh, thank you so much. It's really tremendous. And if you'd like to know more about John and his work, you can have a look at his newly redesigned website, johnkabatzin.com. It's J-O-N-K-A-B-A-T-Z-I-N-N.com. I pick up a copy of his newest book, Mindfulness Meditation for Pain Relief, wherever books are sold. Ram Ram, as we say. Thank you so much. Ram Ram. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening. To learn more about Sharon's work, her events, the Living an Authentic Life Summit, or to get a copy, a pre-order copy of her new book, Real Life, you can visit SharonSalzberg.com. This has been the Meta Hour podcast. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy. And may you live with ease.